Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sullivan. I'm the Director of Catechetical Ministries for the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois, and it's my pleasure to be presenting tonight nine and a half social media tips for the church. Before we begin tonight's webinar, I would like to start, as always, with prayer. So let's take a moment and quiet our hearts and remind ourselves that we are in God's presence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, to the close of the age. Heavenly Father, you gave to your apostles the gifts to spread your word across the world, and the courage to be missionaries. Give to us wisdom to use modern tools of evangelization and the courage to be missionaries to the digital continent so that all people may become disciples of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, again, uh, welcome to everyone this evening. Uh, once again, my name is Jonathan Sullivan. I live here in Springfield, Illinois, uh, and work for the diocese here. I work in the Office for Catechesis. Uh, and I spent uh, quite a few years before that, though, in the world of educational technology, uh, doing uh, online learning and other sort of technology tools to help people uh, learn about the faith. And so uh, it's my pleasure to be able to present here tonight uh, some tips for the use of social media in the church. The purpose of this presentation is to help you both evaluate and learn to use some of the social media tools out there to further the mission of your particular ministry. Uh, rather than delve into one particular to, uh, tool in a, in a deep way, this is going to be more of a shotgun approach. There's going to be a lot of information in a very short amount of time, uh, so don't think you have to get it all right now. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in just a moment. Before we begin, though, I do want to thank our sponsors, uh, my employer, the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois, and my colleagues at the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership for their support of this webinar tonight. So I want to answer a question and then give some general guidelines on the use of social media tools. And the question I want to answer is, why social media? Why should church ministries be interested in the kinds of tools that are available to us online? And there's four basic reasons I think we need to be attentive to these. Uh, the first is because young people are looking for you online. And when I say young people, I don't just mean teenagers. You know, that first generation of digital natives is really graduated college now. Some of them are becoming parents for the first time. We're talking about young adults. Uh, and they're going to be looking for you online, and you don't want to be conspicuous in your absence. So it really pays to have a presence in these social networking places. The second reason is because it adds value to your traditional communication efforts. Uh, it doesn't replace them. I'm not saying you need to get rid of the print newsletter or uh, the other ways that you communicate with folks about your ministries. But these are another way to add value, and as we'll see, to really interact with the people who are already involved in your traditional communication efforts. Uh, and we do that by building relationships. And if you get nothing else out of tonight, uh, I, I hope you understand that the real value in social networking and social media tools is that social component. It's about the interaction. It's about building relationships with folks who have an interest in what you're doing. And by building those relationships, you can really get people involved in a way that traditional communication tools just were never really able to do. And then the fourth reason is, not to be crass about it, these tools are cheap. Uh, most of them are free. Uh, most of the tips that I'll be giving you tonight can be done either for free or on the cheap. Uh, I think the one tip I have uh, may cost around $100 if you do it well, but uh, you know if you can find that in your budget, it's a great thing to do. 
So that's why I think social media tools are something that really those of us in Catholic ministries need to be attentive to. So next I just want to give some general guidelines for how we use social media tools. And this is applicable to just about everything I'm going to be talking tonight. First of all, when we think about using social media tools, we really need to be attentive to what our institutional identity is. Uh, and when I say institutional identity, I mean what is it that your ministry is about? Uh, you need to really be aware of what are your strengths so that you can really play to your strengths when you're using these tools. Uh, be aware of your weaknesses so that you can avoid them so you're not tripping yourself up with weaknesses. But most importantly, you need to be who you are. A lot of times when we talk about social media tools, the phrase that we'll sometimes use is we need to use human language. And that's juxtaposed against institutional language. And it's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. That institutional language is the language of uh, the press release, uh, you know, that sort of much more standoffish kind of language. It, it's not how we talk. When we're using social media tools, we want to use language the same way we do when we're in conversation with someone. Uh, we want that human language to really shine through so that people know that there's a real person behind that social media account. It's not just some PR firm or someone who's just there to try to get something out of them, whether that be volunteer hours or donations, but someone who really cares about them and wants to interact with them in a real way. So be who you are and do it well. Do it to the best of your ability. Another point I want to make is social media is not about how you want to connect with people. It's about how they want to connect with you. And this is very different from traditional methods of communication. Traditional methods of communication, think of the traditional print newsletter. It's about what I'm putting in the newsletter and sending to you, and there's not a real avenue for feedback. You might you know, have an email address in there or a, a mailing address, but that takes a lot of effort on the other side. For someone who's reading that, if they want to reply, that takes a lot of effort for them to write a letter or to write an email. The beauty of social media tools is that it eliminates a lot of those barriers for interaction. You think of something like Facebook. If you post something up to a Facebook page, it's very easy for someone to write a quick comment on it and hit send. So you get very immediate and very personal feedback. Now, as we know, that feedback can be positive or negative. But hopefully, in either case, it's an opportunity to interact. Maybe you write something and someone reacts negatively, but they didn't really understand. Because you now have that avenue for communication, the way they want to connect, you can very easily clean up those misconceptions. Whereas before, if you just sent out a traditional newsletter, they had the misconception and you had no idea that they, that they had misread something. And so you had no way to clear up that confusion. Third, you really do need to dedicate some time to social media and social networking if you're going to do it well. It doesn't have to be a lot of time, but it's not something you can just let coast or else people are going to turn you off pretty quickly. If someone sees a Facebook page or a Twitter account that hasn't been updated in a long time, they're not going to follow it. They're not going to press like on Facebook because they don't see any value in it because there's nothing there. People want to invest, they want to connect with things that are going to bring value to them. And so you need to at least dedicate some time, I recommend at least an hour a week, and that's at the bare minimum, but you can do an hour a week, maybe spread up you know, 15 minutes for four days or something like that, in order to respond to people's comments, put something new out there so that people know, oh, there's someone there, this is someone who's going to bring some value to the conversation, and then so they're going to want to connect with that. And then finally, my general guideline is start slow. You do not need to implement all nine and a half of these suggestions tomorrow. My recommendation is start slowly and build momentum. Pick one of these strategies and practice it for a month. Get really good at it so that it becomes kind of second nature. And then you can add another one and maybe practice that for a little while until you're comfortable with it. Then do another one until you keep going, until you've got a really robust social media strategy implemented for your ministry. Well, that kind of gets us through the preliminaries, so let's jump right in. And I'm going to start with the half. And the half tip that I have for you tonight has to do with your website. What I like to tell people is that websites are the most basic tool for any sort of online communication strategy. In fact, you know, we used to be really proud when, you know, my ministry has a website, my parish, my school, we have a website. Uh, we used to be really, really proud about that and wanted to show that off. 
the truth is you don't get any points anymore for having a website. It's expected. People don't give you brownie points just because you have a nice looking website. Uh, it's expected in this day and age. This doesn't mean though that you can neglect your website because Typically, it's going to be the first place that people are going to look for you. They're going to put your ministry's name, your parish, your school's name into Google, and hopefully that website will be one of the first things that pops up when they're looking for you. So you need to have a website. You need to have an attractive website, and that's sometimes been a struggle for some of our ministries. Uh, you know, My recommendation is find someone who's really good at web stuff and uh, someone that you can kind of call and keep their favorite beer or their favorite cookies on hand so that you can call them over and uh, kind of gently bribe them to help you out whenever you need a hand. Or if you have the resources, I really do suggest that you, you budget for some money to hire someone to come and give you a good-looking website. Because while a good website won't necessarily get you brownie points, a bad website will really turn people away. Uh, it's an immediate turnoff when people go to your website and can't find what they're looking for. Uh, it's unattractive graphics. You know, it looks like it's from the 1970s, the pictures and things like that. So make sure that it, you have a good website. Uh, like I said, you need to make things easy to find on your website. Put things on the front page that people are going to be looking for. Parishes, please put your mass times on your front page. That is the number one thing that people are going to be looking for on your website, is to go and find out what time Mass is. And if it's hard to find, they're going to go to another parish. Um, if the times are wrong, that's even worse. And I've had a couple of instances where I've been out traveling, and I've been trying to look for a Mass, and I get online, find the Mass times, and then I go, and it's halfway through Mass, because they haven't bothered to update the Mass times on their website. Uh, schools. Make sure that it's very easy for people to find information on how to contact you, on how to get registration information, any sort of uh, policies that people are going to be asking for on a regular basis. Make sure you have clear links to those things on the front page of your website so that they can find them. Because if they can't find it easily, they're just going to go somewhere else. Uh, for other types of ministries, make sure your contact information is in a very clear place. Traditionally, that's down at the bottom of the web page. Uh, and I'd suggest you know, every single web page on your site should have your contact information at the bottom of the page so people aren't having to click a contact link or try to find it somewhere else. People, they've, we've kind of trained people with website design to look at the bottom of a page to find the contact information. Those are the things that people are going to be looking for on your website, so please make sure that they're easy to find. Uh, next, uh, you, on your website, you're going to want to put the links to your other online presences. And uh, you may notice here I've kind of got the two kind of traditional icons uh, that people use for Twitter and Facebook. Uh, you know, put those on your front page somewhere. Again, traditionally that's going to be kind of at the top somewhere, maybe the top right of that front page is where people are going to be looking for those links. So if you have a Twitter account for your ministry, if you have a Facebook page, make sure that you're linking to those and that those links are in a very conspicuous spot. Uh, you don't need tiny links for those. People like to have big in-your-face icons for those sorts of things. So make sure that they're there and that they're easy to find. And then finally, make sure you're reviewing your website regularly. Again, make sure the information is up to date. There's nothing worse than having out-of-date information on a website because then you're just going to confuse people and they're going to think you don't care enough to give them the information that they're looking for easily. All right. Excuse me just a minute, I'm having trouble with my uh, pointer here. Hmm. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, so tip number one, now that we've got the half out of the way, tip number one, if you really want to be able to jumpstart your social media efforts, uh, my number one recommendation is that you make some sort of exclusive announcement through your social media efforts. Our diocese, uh, just about a year ago, got a new bishop. And one of the things that we did to kind of jumpstart our Facebook account was to let people know one of the first places that you're going to be able to find out who the new bishop is is on the Facebook page. We also did a thing where people could sign up for a text message so that as soon as the announcement was made, we sent a text message out to folks on their phones. But one of the things we did was say, go to our Facebook page, become a fan, and as soon as we have that information, we're going to put that on our Facebook page. 
And so you can see on April 20th, 2010, at 5.03 in the morning, we made the announcement on our website that Bishop Thomas John Paprocki from the Archdiocese of Chicago had been made our new bishop. And people knew that they would be able to go there and find that out. In about a three-month period, we went from having 100, 150 fans on our website to having over 500 fans just because we let people know this is one of the first ways you'll be able to find out who the new bishop is. By giving people that kind of heads-up information that this would be the first place, that they would be one of the first to know, it really got them engaged, and we have kept that momentum. So we now have, a year later, we didn't just stop at that over 500, we now have over 700 fans on our Facebook page because we've built that momentum. We kind of hit that critical mass where we're just continuing to grow, and people are continuing to comment and interact with us on our Facebook page. And that's been a, a real blessing for our diocese as we strive to kind of reach out to uh, folks in the pew that we don't always have real, real good uh, connections with. We have our diocesan newspaper. We have a few other ways that we can reach people. But, you know, it's hard to reach those people in the pew when you're in some ways and sometimes three hours away from where they live. So having a Facebook page that covers our entire diocese has really been a, a blessing for us. And having that jump start for it uh, has really, really proven beneficial. Tip number two, ask a question. This is another wonderful way to interact with folks uh, on a blog, on Twitter, those sorts of things. And here's just a quick example of something I did this morning. Uh, I, people knew uh, through my Twitter account that I'd be offering this webinar tonight, and so I just asked a question. For the participants in my webinar tonight, why do you use social media? And within hours, I had several responses. So my friend Jared, uh, responded that he uses social media to connect, to share stories, to inspire others, to find inspiration, to explore, and to communicate. Uh, Vita Catholic responded that because she sits in front of a computer all day with spare time and gets bored of reading government websites. So that's why she uses social media as a way to kind of spice up her day. And John Ronaldo wrote that uh, social media is not just about putting information out there, but it's about getting information back. For instance, how I asked Twitter uh, about this question. And because social media is the best way to reach people. Now here's an example. I asked a question and within just an, a couple hours I was able to get some feedback. Now you can do that to ask specific questions. Maybe you want to have a, a real question you want to ask. Uh, sometimes people talk about using the hive mind of Twitter. If they've got a question that they don't have an answer to that has a specific answer, they can just throw the question out there and someone on Twitter is going to know. But sometimes it's also just a nice way to interact. Uh, we've done that a lot with the Facebook and blog of our diocese. Just asking a question to get people kind of talking about a particular topic. Uh, so we've put out on Facebook, you know, just asking people, what did you give up for Lent? And it's really inspiring to see people will write back, uh, talking about uh, giving up a bad habit or trying to incorporate more prayer into their lives. Uh, you know, getting to see that and, and have people share what they're doing is really inspirational. Sometimes we'll ask if there's any special prayer requests out there. If we're having a, a Curia Day of Prayer or a special Curia Mass, we'll ask for prayer requests. We'll take those to our prayer and to our, our liturgies and, and hold those up before God as a way of just connecting with folks out there. Uh, again, it, it's about the interaction. It's about uh, having a conversation back and forth between people. And sometimes it can get pretty extensive. It's, it's really neat to, to have that connection with folks. Uh, next, number three, give something away. This can be really fun. Uh, rewarding that conversation, rewarding that interaction. Uh, maybe you post something on your blog and say, uh, tell me about uh, your favorite Christmas memory. You know, maybe you do something during Advent. Say, tell, me, tell us about your favorite Christmas memory, and we're going to choose randomly out of all the responses and send this book for, uh, of Christmas reflections or something like that. Uh, and you'll get a lot of responses that way uh, because they want to share, but also be because people like to win stuff. <laughs> and we've done that a few times in our diocese where we'll ask people to just send a response and we'll choose someone randomly to, uh, to get some sort of prize package. That can be a lot of fun and a great way to reach out to people. Uh, I recommend keeping it small. You don't need huge prize packages. Again, uh, just a book that might be lying around the office that no one's using or a small icon or statue or something like that, something you don't have to pay a lot of shipping to ship out, obviously. Uh, another nice thing is sometimes if you have a special program coming up that maybe uh, there's a small fee attached to, giving someone free admission to something. You know, that could be another great way that really doesn't cost you anything, but encourages that interaction and gets people to your event. 
Uh, one other caution is on Facebook, be careful because there are very specific rules for these sorts of promotions on Facebook. They have very, uh, pretty strict uh, rules on what you can do for promoting and giving things away via contests on Facebook. And failure to adhere to those rules could cause your page to get shut down if you have a Facebook page for your ministry. Uh, so when I uh, send out the notes on my website tomorrow, I'll include a link to Facebook specific rules on promotions, so you should be able to look those over if you're interested in doing something like that. Next, start a conversation. And this is where I say Twitter is excellent at promoting conversations. And you wouldn't necessarily think that. Because of the 140 character limit that, that Twitter has, very short little things is all you can send. But I've been amazed at how Twitter is so useful for starting conversations and, and finding out information from people, not just asking questions, but just in more general terms. Uh, Twitter has lots of real experts on there, uh, catechists, Catholic educators, parish musicians, pastors, all sorts of people are interacting on Twitter, and they are an absolute wealth of knowledge, experience, and wisdom. And if you're interacting on Twitter, you can take part in that. This is a great example on the screen here. I had asked uh, back in February, what would you tell a group of principals about using social media in education, faith formation, marketing, and communication? I have an upcoming presentation I'm going to be giving to some principals, and I just you know, wanted to see what the wisdom out there was. And Paul Masick, who doesn't know me from Adam, I've never met him in real life, uh, had never chatted with him before now, except maybe just a little bit on Twitter, wrote me back and said, if you want to chat, email me. I have a lot of thoughts. Uh, and so I did email him, and we ended up having about a 30 to 45 minute phone conversation about this topic. And so he gave me a whole bunch of just great information and ideas that I'll be able to take to this presentation that I'll be giving to principals. Now again, I've never met Paul face to face had never really interacted with him before that. But he's out there, he has all this knowledge and experience, and he wants to share it. And the great thing is when you're on Twitter, you can share your knowledge and experience as well. It's not just about what you can get from folks, but it's really about what you can share. Now, it's hard to be conversational like this as an organization. I talked a little bit about earlier about that importance of human language. This is why I tend to recommend that for organizations, you don't necessarily need a Twitter account. As an organization, I think Twitter is much more useful when you use it as an individual because it's easier to have those human conversations and because it's a lot easier to keep track of what's going on and having these conversations with folks. Uh, so that's why I'd say, you know, your parish doesn't necessarily need a Twitter account, but your pastor should or your DRE should because they're going to get a lot more out of it than the institution will. Now, you can set up an institutional Twitter account, and you know if you have an RSS feed or something like that, feed those links, feed your blog into that, uh, and that's a, a good way to do that. But I, I really do think that uh, the real value in, uh, in Twitter is as an individual rather than as an organization. My next tip, find out what others are saying about you. And this is really uh, this is kind of a ninja move because not a whole lot of people think about this. Uh, Google Alerts is a service through Google. It's a free service. As long as you have a Google account, you can sign up for it. And what it lets you do is have Google searches emailed to you. Now, on the surface, that doesn't sound like... Uh, something that's necessarily useful until you start thinking that Google also lets you specifically search specific sites. So you'll see over on the left side here on some of these searches I have set up in my Google Alerts account, it says site colon and then HTTP colon slash slash whatever. What that lets you do is instead of searching all of the internet through Google, it specifically searches one site. So for instance, I've got the Intelligencer on here, the Herald Review, My Journal Courier, sj-r.com. These are all newspapers within our diocese. And so I've set up specific searches through Google Alerts that uh, whenever the word Catholic appears on any of those newspaper sites, I get an email with a link to that story. What's this, what this lets me do then is keep track of what people are saying about the Catholic Church in general or the diocese in, uh, in particular in our, in our 
newspapers in our diocese. And then I can choose what to do with that. If it's a negative story, yeah, I, I don't do much about that. Uh, but if it's something really positive, let's say it's something about one of our schools or one of our parishes, maybe a parish is having a big festival or a school celebrating a 100-year anniversary or something, I can then take that link and put it into our Facebook account and share that story with everyone that's following us on Facebook. It's a way to celebrate the wonderful things that are being said about us outside of our diocesan communication strategies. Uh, and so it really has been a wonderful way to share those stories with people who wouldn't necessarily see that. So, you know, we're a pretty large diocese. We're a large rural diocese, 28 counties. Uh, it would take about four or five hours to drive from one end of our diocese to, uh, to the other. And so people in one end of a diocese aren't necessarily going to see the stories in the newspaper on another end of the diocese. But this is a way we can share those. Again, it also just keeps me up to date on what people are saying about our diocese. So if we can know, oh, here was a, a story over here that was kind of maybe either wasn't true or portraying us in a negative light, we can go and kind of help out over there and say, you know, this is what we meant, uh, this was wrong in the article, we need a correction. In fact, that happened just yesterday. Uh, there was an article in one of the newspapers in our diocese that uh, had some misinformation about uh, Lent, and so we were able to, within hours, uh, send an email out to that newspaper and say, this is incorrect, here's the correct information, and they were able to update that on their website so that that wrong information is no longer there. But really, the, the real use I get out of this, again, is to find out the great things being said about us in other places and sharing that through our Facebook page. This is actually what one of those emails looks like. And so you can see, here's a, I got a link from the Herald Review which is uh, one of our newspapers here in Decatur, Illinois, about uh, the 100th anniversary of the building of St. Patrick Church in Decatur. So I was able to post that story to our diocesan Facebook page. And people really, they get a kick out of that, especially if it's from their area or about their church or their school. You know, they love seeing those things, because maybe they missed the story or just seeing that the diocese is celebrating that. Now, this is really useful, obviously, for the larger geographical area like we are, because we can get a lot of different stories from a lot of different sources. Uh, but, you know, if you're in a large metro area or just, uh, you know, know that you're going to be talked about a lot in the local media, you know, this can be a great tool to use. And, again, it gets the email directly to you. You don't have to go out searching for these things. They come to you. Next, make a video. Now, this is the one that might cost a little bit of money. But the truth is, these small sort of digital video cameras have gotten very cheap. You can get a small handheld device like the one uh, you see pictured here for under $100. So, you know, either if you can't find that money in your budget, maybe just ask a parishioner that you know would be interested in something like this. Just ask, you know, hey, we're trying to, to build up some social media stuff. We'd like to do some video. Could you pitch in? You know, $20, $30 or so, you get a couple people that can do that, and bam, you can go out and buy one of these small little video cameras. And they are super easy. They are literally like a point and shoot. You just hold it up, press a button, and you're recording. And then you can upload those things to a service like YouTube or Vimeo or one of these and create really awesome videos. So maybe you make a video about uh, your church building. You know, I would love to see churches go out and put on their websites little tours of their church buildings. Uh, you know, it's great for PSR classes to be able to use that in the classroom as kind of a church tour or just to help people understand this is what an AMBO is, this is what uh, the narthex is, this is the functions of all these different parts of the church. You know, it's a great catechetical tool. Or maybe you do it around specific issues. For instance, uh, just a week or so ago, uh, our Office for Social Concerns at our diocese put out a video about the 40 Days for Life campaign that we're doing here in our diocese. And so the director of our office, Sister Jane here, created just a short little like, three, four, five minute video just talking about the campaign, letting people know how they can get more information. Uh, you know, again, it's, it's a, a much more human way, a much more interactive way than just putting out a press release. It lets people put a face to what's going on. It lets people hear things in real human language. Uh, you can write a script if you want to, uh, but really, you know, if you can do it off the cuff, that's even better, because then it just seems to flow much more naturally, and you're not trying to read off of something. A quick note on this uh, in terms of what kind of services. Uh, our diocese, and, and I personally, we use a service called Vimeo. And there's a couple reasons why we choose to put our videos on Vimeo rather than YouTube. One is that for uh, you know, your standard account, YouTube has a limit of 15 minutes. So if you have something longer, like 
for instance, let's say this webinar, which I'll be putting up on my website tomorrow, uh, you know, the 15 minute time limit just doesn't make a whole lot of sense and I don't want to go through the effort to edit it into 15 minute chunks and put up multiple videos. Uh, another reason is YouTube, uh, to put it nicely, uh, the commenters aren't always kind to uh, religious types of videos and the Catholic Church in particular. So you either have to disable comments or you have to really be diligent, diligent about monitoring the comments that will be put on your videos. Vimeo is a much more professional style of site. Uh, the kinds of comments you get here are going to be uh, from people who are interested in what you're doing. There aren't a whole lot of trolls on Vimeo. So you don't have to do as much as much uh, due diligence on comments when they're posted to your videos here. And personally, I just think Vimeo is just kind of a nicer looking site. YouTube's still uh, kind of rough around the edges in some ways. And Vimeo has a very nice, attractive design. So that's why we've chosen to go with Vimeo. And it is the service that I recommend if you're interested in doing more types of video. You know, one, uh, this isn't even in my outline, but you know, just one other tip is another great thing to do with those little video cameras is if you're not real comfortable doing it, hand it off to the kids. You know, give it to your youth group and just say, hey, go make us a video. Go make us a, a commercial on why people should go to mass. We'll put it on our website. You will be amazed at the creativity that those kinds of uh, youth projects can generate through video. They love doing these things. A lot of them already have a lot of uh, experience with these sorts of things. So you know, just hand it off to them and let them run with it. They will, do, they will just amaze you at what they will come up with. Next, ask for pictures. Places like Facebook or maybe even your website, you have a photo gallery on them. Ask people to email you photos that they take. And they can just be, you know, photos of events and those sorts of things. Maybe you have a, a parishioner who loves taking pictures. Maybe you ask them to be your unofficial photographer at events if they're going to be there. And then just email you the pictures afterwards so that you can put them up in that photo gallery. Or another great thing is, you know, kind of ask for themes. This is a great thing for schools is to ask people to just send you pictures of uh, them in your school uh, t-shirt or sweatshirts or whatever kind of apparel that you sell. Ask people to send you pictures of them in your apparel for you to post. You know, they're going to love it because, you know, they get a little, hey, did you see me on the website? And, you know, wasn't looking good? Or, you know, the great thing is, you know, ask people to do it in, in funny places. You know, if someone's going on a vacation, you know, ask for a picture of, uh, you know, our sweatshirt in Rome or something like that. Uh, people really get a kick out of that and they'll really send you those things. And you can post those. Like I said, if you have a, a gallery on your web page, you can put it there. Facebook obviously has photo galleries built into them. It's a great way to generate that kind of content for your website or for your Facebook page. Another great little thing is combine this with that give something away we talked about earlier. Say that, you know, send us a picture and we'll put you in a drawing for another sweatshirt or uh, something else, you know, whatever you have to give away. Uh, it's a great way to get people involved and excited about being involved in that project with you. And like I said, they just, they love it. They love seeing their picture up on the website. That people get a real kick out of that. Obviously, with kids, you want to be a little careful with that because uh, you don't want to put uh, identifying information with a picture of a child on your website. Uh, the, the rule of thumb I've always heard, which I think is, is a pretty good rule of thumb, is you know there's three pieces of information, location, name, and image, and you never want to put uh, all three of those in the same place. You never want to identify a child with the picture and say where that picture was taken. Uh, because then it becomes very easy for someone to track that person down. You know, if you have image and place but no name, or if you have uh, place and name but no image, you know, two out of the three is, is generally going to be safe, but you don't want to have those three pieces of information in the same place. So that's kind of the rule of thumb that you want to do when we talk about having uh, pictures of children on your website. Next, uh, this is kind of a new service and one that I'm not sure a whole lot of people know about, and that's Foursquare. Foursquare is a very interesting service that allows people to check in to different locations around the city. And as they do that, they get uh, you know, little prizes, like these little badges you see over on the right side there. As you do different things, you get different kinds of badges. So the little bees there, that's for being in the same place as 50 other people who had all checked in on Foursquare at the same time. That's the swarm. Uh, there was one you can see up there. Uh, Green Bay that was specifically for the Super Bowl this past year. Uh, the one right next to that is Follow the Yellow Brick Road. That, that's actually for checking in in Kansas and then checking out of Kansas because then you're no longer in Kansas. 
uh, you know, little joke badges and things like that. Uh, but people love doing this because if you check in the most at certain places, you become on Foursquare the mayor of that place. So down the lower right, you can see a small list of a few of the places I'm mayors at. Uh, our cathedral here in Springfield, the pastoral center where I work, uh, one of the little local grocery stores. Uh, you know, I've checked in there more than any other person, so you become the quote-unquote mayor of those places. But the real reason that you want to be aware of Foursquare is that uh, you either want to put your parish or your particular ministry in Foursquare or see if someone else has already done it for you. Uh, this is the uh, Foursquare page for our Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. And you can see when people get on there, it shows a little map, so it locates them, lets them know who the mayor is, how many people have checked in, how many different times. And people can also add tips. And this is just little you know, tips to people who might be visiting that place of something they might be interested in. So if it's a restaurant, you might say, you know, ask for the special or you know, try this uh, really awesome dessert that they do really well at this restaurant. For our cathedral here, I added a tip just noting that the cathedral had been restored a couple of years ago and is really beautiful. And uh, to check out some really unique stained glass windows and, and mosaics there in the cathedral. That's a little tip that I added to let people know that this is something, you know, if you're stopping by, you might want to see. But, you know, you just want to check and see if your place is on Facebook just to see. Maybe people have put tips that you want to know about. Maybe you want to see who the mayor is of your place. Uh, a lot of businesses will actually give specials to mayors. For instance, there's a lot of Starbucks out there that if you're the mayor of Starbucks, you get one free cup of coffee a day. Now, you might ask, why on earth would Starbucks just be giving coffee away? Well, the point isn't that they're giving coffee away to that one person. It's that they have then 20 other people who are coming to Starbucks a lot to try to become the mayor to get that cup of coffee. So by giving away one cup of coffee, they have 20 other people coming in and buying cups of coffee. It's a way to, again, engage people and generate that kind of interest and interaction with them so that uh, you know, they become involved in what you're doing and really try to, to be a part of it. And then the last one of the day, and this is a uh, one that, again, may cost a little bit of money, but doesn't have to cost a whole lot, and that's advertising on Facebook. And this is probably the most uh, oh, complex tip that I'm offering tonight. Uh, what you see at the top of the screen here is a little ad that we experimented with in our diocese just before Christmas on Facebook. And it just says, looking for Christmas Mass. Find Christmas Mass Times at a Catholic Church near you, a blessed Merry Christmas from the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois. And when people would click on that ad, they would be taken to a page on our website where we had listed all the parishes in our diocese and all of their Christmas Eve and Christmas Day Mass Times. And that's all that was on that page. Just letting people know, hey, you know, if you want to come to Mass, we're here. This is what's available. We would love to see you. The table that's on this page uh, just kind of shows the breakdown. Uh, we wound up spending a total of $50 on the entire ad. Now, we lucked out because I had discovered a coupon code for $50 worth of free Facebook advertising, so it didn't really cost us anything. But if we had paid for it, this would have been $50. And the way Facebook ads work is when you log in and set up an ad, you say how much you're willing to pay per display or per click. Uh, I usually recommend per 1,000 displays. And maybe we said that we'd be willing to pay up to $0.25 cents uh, for every thousand displays. Now that doesn't mean that's what you're actually going to pay. They do it kind of on an auction system, so different people are kind of vying for the the ad space, and so if you outbid everyone else, your ad's going to get put there. And so on the first day, December 21st, we had over 50,000 displays of our ad. That means it was shown over 50,000 times. Now not to that many people per se. Some people would have seen it multiple times, but it was displayed that many times. The next two days, we had uh, 99,000 and 98,000 uh, each time, and then the last day we had about $80,000. So this ad was shown over 329,000 times. That's how many times this ad was displayed on Facebook to different people. And then it was actually clicked on 34 times. Now that doesn't seem like a great rate. <laughs> you know, it's 0 0.01% of the times that it was displayed that it was clicked. But, you know, that may be 34 more people that would have gone to Mass that might not have otherwise. And certainly just the goodwill that this might have generated from those 300,000 sometimes of just sending our Christmas blessings and Christmas wishes out to people. You know, just having that kind of uh, simple interaction with people uh, is not, is, can be a nice thing. The other thing that's really nice about Facebook ads is they have very sophisticated targeting. Uh, 
you know, you can choose if you have a men's retreat coming up, you can target just men. Uh, you can do it within a geographical area. Obviously, for something like a diocese, this isn't something we want to display to, to people across the United States. We were able to target people within certain cities in our diocese or within a 10-mile radius of those cities. Now, we didn't, weren't able to cover all of our diocese. Like I said, we are a large rural diocese, so we couldn't cover all the geographical areas. But we got the major uh, population centers covered with that. So Facebook is really sophisticated in the ways that you can target your ads and really get them to the people that you want to see by age, by gender, by interests. Uh, it's really interesting. So that's something that we're still kind of playing with, seeing what that looks like and, and how that's going to work for us. Uh, but it's something just to keep in the back of your mind is, you know, you don't have to do $50. You can just, if you've got $10 lying around that you just want to experiment with. Uh, and obviously, if you're a parish or a school, you know, you're not going to have as many people that you're trying to display to. So you might get a lot more bang for your buck uh, than we as a diocese would because we have such a large geographical area that we are trying to, to cover. So advertising on Facebook is something I think we're going we're to see a lot more of in the future. I think this, this has some very interesting possibilities. Well, that kind of covers my nine and a half tips for social networking. Like I said, a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Uh, what I'm going to do now is click over and find out some of the questions that people have asked about uh, and see if we can't answer some of those questions. So Tony asks, uh, in your point about Paul Masick and the great information you received from him, how do you know that he is credible? Thank you. Uh, well, partly because I know who Paul Masick is. Uh, I know that he works down uh, in the Archdiocese of St. Louis. I'd heard of him. He's done some work in our diocese before. Uh, but also, you know, when you get onto someone's Twitter account, you, know, you want to check who they are. Uh, if they don't list a website, if they don't list a bio, you know, you, you probably don't want to follow that person if you don't already know who they are because you don't have any way of really following up on who they are. Uh, and there are spam accounts on Twitter. I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to say there's not. Uh, but, you know, as you get used to Twitter and see how people interact on it, it becomes pretty easy to figure out who the real people are and who the spam, who the spammers are. Uh, they just, like I said, people are really good at recognizing humans through language, and that's why that human language is so important. Spammers don't use human language because it tends to be all automated or, or whatnot. So it becomes, you, you actually get pretty sophisticated in how you can figure out if someone is legitimate or not. But again, if they list a bio on a website, then it becomes pretty easy to figure out whether they're legitimate or not. Sister Caroline asks, what is the relationship between a blog, Facebook, and Twitter? Oh, well, um, you know, they're, they do very similar things in very different ways. The way I like to think about it is a blog is for getting long-form information out there. Uh, blog posts tend to be a little bit longer than Twitter, obviously, uh, since Twitter only uh, allows you up to 140 characters to talk about. So a blog is going to be much more long-form about getting real deep information out to people. Facebook is good for that interaction. And not that blogs aren't, but blogs are going to tend to be much more deeper conversations in the comments. Uh, whereas Facebook is tend to be a little more surface in the comments. Uh, you know, I really like this, thumbs up, those sorts of things. Um, but Facebook is a, another great way to interact with folks. And then Twitter, like I said, for me, it, it's really a, a personal tool. I get a lot out of it personally. Uh, just with short interactions with folks, asking quick questions, what do you think about this? Now, the real relationship, I would say, uh, between those is that they are all ways to share information. So for instance, with our diocesan blog, uh, we have a blog and we send it out on the website, but whenever we send that out, it also automatically gets posted to our Facebook and our Twitter accounts. So that people don't have to be subscribed to our blog, they don't have to continually come back to our website to see if there's something new, they know that if they just join us on Facebook or join us on Twitter, they'll be able to get those updates. And so Facebook and Twitter almost become conduits through which we can reach people with our blog. So that's, that's one way we can think about the relationship between those three. Sister Carolyn also asks, Facebook ads, what's the difference between displays and clicks? A display is just when it appears on a screen. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean someone even paid attention to it. You know, it could just be over there in the sidebar and they don't really notice it. But it was on the page that someone was viewing. Uh, whereas a click is when someone actually sees the ad and clicks on it and then goes to that page that you wanted to direct them to. 
Uh, so again, I haven't seen a whole lot of real good information on you know what we can expect to be a good click-through rate. Uh, again, for that ad that we did, it was uh, one one hundredth of one percent. <laughs> Uh, but it was 34 people that might not have gone to mass otherwise, and I'm, it's hard to put a, a price tag on that. But again, part of the ad wasn't just to get people to, to click through, but just to send them our Christmas wishes and let them know that the diocese is thinking about them. And she also asks, do you know if those who clicked on the ad actually went to church? We had no way of tracking that. Uh, you know, I, I thought about how that might be accomplished. The only thing I could think of was if we had been able to get like let's say little postcards or something into all of our parishes uh, with a little questionnaire asking you know how did you find out about this mass time and put Facebook as one of the, the check boxes there but uh, for a diocese that doesn't make a whole lot of sense and you'd never get a real count on that anyway because there's no way you can force people to pick up one of those cards and fill it out so we knew when we went into it that we wouldn't have any way of actually measuring if someone went to mass that wouldn't have otherwise, but it seemed like a nice uh, a nice experiment. Like I said, we had a coupon code uh, for the free advertising anyway, so we didn't actually put any money into it. And that's, actually, I should have mentioned that. You know, before you put an ad on Facebook, just Google Facebook ad coupon. Uh, they put those sorts of coupons out all the time, and so you know, if you can find you know, $15, $20 of free advertising, you know, they just try a little experiment because it's not going to cost you anything. Uh, Pat asked, can you talk about safe environment concerns about tagging children and adolescents using first and last name? Sure. Um, you know, my recommendation on Facebook tagging, and for those that don't know, what, what that means is when you put a picture up on Facebook, you can quote unquote tag it, which means that you just create a little notation that such and such person is in this picture. So I can tag myself in a picture, and so when someone views that picture, they'll know that this person here is Jonathan Sullivan. Uh, obviously, we don't want to be doing that uh, on our institutional Facebook pages. Uh, but there's not a whole lot we can do about someone else doing it on their pictures. So my recommendation is don't do tagging, just period, on your pictures, because then you're not having to worry about it, number one, and... Uh, uh, it just doesn't become a concern then. Uh, but you can't stop other people from doing it. But you might want to go through every once in a while, see if someone's tagged something in your picture that looks like it might be something that uh, involves a child or an adolescent. You can always remove that tag. Uh, you'll see a little link next to the person's name that says remove tag, and you can click that, and that will take that tagging information off. Sister Carolyn also mentions that with all the information overload that we have today, I feel that folks tend to ignore the ads on Facebook. I, I would agree, uh, and that was one of the things we wanted to try with our experiment, was just to see if we would get any sort of uh, feedback and click-through, and we got some. Uh, we did another experiment a couple months later advertising a men's retreat, uh, and as I recall, we didn't get nearly the click-through even that we got on the, the Christmas ad. But, you know, after over 300,000 views, you know, a few people probably saw it. And, you know, there's ways to increase whether or not people are going to really look at your ad. Obviously, the title that you give your ad is going to be important. You want to make it a catchy title. If you can use a catchy photo, uh, that's good. Uh, you know, that's one of my concerns about Facebook, actually, is some of the pictures you see in the ads are a little bit racy. Um, that's obviously not something that, uh, you know, I personally approve of. But that's... Uh, that's ways that you can get people to, to notice your ads more than they might otherwise. Any other questions? If you have any questions, feel free to, to open up the question panel in the little GoToWebinar control panel and, and ask yourself uh, and ask a question. Fabian asks, what about GoToMeeting? Oh, what about the service we're using now? Obviously, you know, this is a great way to reach out to people. If you have uh, you know, some really targeted information that you want to get out to a population. Uh, you know, we in my office have really loved using GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar, obviously because it allows us to do these sorts of things for a, a wide audience, but also we've used them for much smaller groups. We have uh, regional principals in our diocese that meet a few times a year. And for a principal to take two hours, two plus hours out of a day to get out of their school, drive to our diocesan offices, then have a two-hour meeting, and then drive another hour or two hours back, you know, they're basically out of their building the entire day. And 
that was difficult for them, especially if they get there in the morning and there's some sort of crisis. All of a sudden, they have to deal with that crisis, and they're going to have to miss the meeting. So that was one of the real strong reasons that we decided to go with a service like GoToMeeting was it allowed our principals to stay in their schools. They just jump on uh, when the meeting time comes, and we have a, a conversation via the computer. They were a little bit skeptical at first, but after we did kind of a trial run, they really liked it. They saw that this was not difficult. Uh, it made the meetings a lot shorter because people weren't having those side conversations and whatnot. And, uh, and so they were able to spend a lot less time on the road and in meetings because uh, they could just stay there and, and use the computer instead. Uh, you're asking a question about price. Uh, for our budget, we technically we come out about even on our budget. Uh, the package that we use for the full go-to webinar service is about a little over $700 a year, and that gives you up to for the webinar service up to a thousand people. So we could we could have a thousand people on this webinar right now. We don't, <laughs> but the system would allow for up to a thousand people in on this webinar. Uh, the meeting side allows up to 16 people and doesn't have uh, some of the different features that the full webinar service does. And I don't know what the pricing is on just the meeting portion. It's a lot less than the 700. Uh, so uh, for us, you know, when we budgeted out and saw based on, you know, when we would have people come to our offices for meetings and when we feed them and those sorts of things, technically we break even just on a pure budget uh, calculation, but it's allowed us to do a whole lot more so that we can do these sorts of webinars. Uh, and so we get a whole lot more out of that $700 than we were just when people were coming. And we still have face-to-face -face meetings. I don't want to give the impression that we've eliminated those completely. Even those regional principals, they still come together for our first meeting of the year so that they can see each other face-to-face -face and, and, you know, have a meal together and those sorts of things. You know, that's still valuable. Uh, we don't want to go completely online. But to have that option, especially when it's January and it's snowing out and different things, you know, to not have to get out into the weather and drive to the diocesan offices have been, has been really nice for folks. Debbie asks, how many admins do you recommend for a parish or a school to have for a Facebook page? How many posts do you recommend each day or week? That's a great question. Uh, for our diocese, we have two administrators on our Facebook page, myself and our webmaster. Um, you know, I would say limit it. You don't want to just give anyone access. My recommendation is give access to the people that you know or already plugged in on Facebook who know how to use it well and who know how to get the kind of information that you want to post on the Facebook page. People who are going to be out there getting, you know, what are the events that we're putting on that we need to put on the Facebook page, uh, who can, you know, do those Google alerts and find the different links to share things. Get people who are already plugged in because they're already going to be predisposed to helping you out that way. In terms of how many posts do I recommend, uh, you know, I really like the way the USCCB does it on their Facebook page. And their goal, as I understand it, is to try to put out three different pieces a day. And it usually involves, you know, uh, uh, the scriptures for the day, they always put those up on the Facebook page so that people can click on those. And then two other sorts of things, whether it be a blog post or a press release or uh, a video or something like that. Um, obviously, it's going to depend on the size of your organization and the different things that you're doing. You know, a small rural parish, uh, you three things a day might be way too much or might just be a stretch. You might not have that much. And you don't want to just put stuff out to put stuff out there. You want to make sure that's going to be valuable to folks. So, you know, just kind of experiment and experiment with it and see what feels right. You know, I think if you're putting over 10, 15 things a day, that's probably overkill. And people are probably going to start thinking that you're just spamming them and they're going to hide you on Facebook so that they don't have to see all that content. So my my recommendation would be less is more. Make sure that it, what you're putting out there is good quality stuff that people are really interested in. Kathy asks, please talk a little more about using our strengths in our institutional identity. Great question. Um, you know, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about who you are as an institution. If you're an educational institution uh, and maybe your focus is on, uh, let's say, mathematics, you know, tie that into your Facebook stuff somehow. Uh, don't try to be something you're not. Uh, you know, obviously we have a great strength in all of our ministries, just being part of the Catholic Church and really promoting that and celebrating the things that we do as, as church. Um, you know, when I'm talking, 
I'm not saying this very well. It's a little bit nebulous at times, but you know, just don't don't try to be something you're not. If you're not a big tech savvy kind of thing, don't try to pretend that you are. Just put out little reflections. Put out uh, whatever you are. A, a great example for Parish. If you have a really strong homilist, first of all, God bless you, <laughs> and you're really lucky if you have a really good a pastor who's a really good homilist. Uh, but you know, see if you could get him to record those and post them up onto the Facebook or your blog or whatever. Uh, you know, find out what's going on out there that's really good and that people really like, and and send that wider. So that that's kind of what I'm talking about when I talk about using those strengths. Pat asks, can you lift up some names of bishops who've used social networking well? Video, tweets, blogs, etc. Sure. Um, oh gosh, off the top of my head, uh, uh, the Cardinal out in Boston, whose name's completely escaping me at the moment, uh, he was one of the first blogging and tweeting cardinals out there. Uh, so he's on Twitter and has a very wonderful blog. And I wish I could remember his name, and I'm just blanking on that. I'm sorry. Uh, I know in my area, uh, Archbishop Carlson out of St. Louis, Sean O'Malley, thank you, yes, Cardinal O'Malley. <laughs> uh, he's been doing great stuff. Uh, Archbishop Carlson has a really good Facebook page uh, on Facebook. Uh, he puts out some really good stuff there, different reflections in his column. Um, in terms of video, if, if I can uh, kind of hold us up, I think our diocese is starting to do a lot of really good video stuff. Our bishop, Bishop Paprocki, uh, puts out his column in our newspaper every two weeks. And whenever he does that, it appears in the print version. It appears on our website. And he records a video of himself doing the column, you know, uh, reading the column out loud. And we put that out both as video and as an MP3 so that people can listen to it if they want to. And that actually goes back to our former bishop, uh, now Archbishop Lucas of Omaha, who would record podcasts of all of his columns. And so now we've gone from even just the podcasting to video casting those as well. So those are some of the ones that I'm aware of that are doing a, a very good job. Uh, and obviously we'd love to see more. Debbie notes that Archbishop Amond is pretty active on Facebook and Twitter, the Archbishop out of New Orleans, and I'm sure there's others. Uh, I'm just not thinking of them off the top of my head. But uh, I'll tell you what, I will try to find a list of those, and I will put those in the notes in the blog post that goes with the video tomorrow uh, if you're interested in those. Well, that looks like all the questions that we have queued up for now. We are getting to be just about at the end of our time. So I do just want to mention again that uh, you can reach me at jonathanfsullivan.com. Tomorrow morning I will have a video of this webinar posted up there along with the different notes that went along with it. You can also follow me on Twitter at Sully Joe. That's S-U-L-L-I-J-O. So if you're on Twitter or would like to be, feel free to follow me on there. And, uh, you know, just shoot me a, a message and let me know that you were on here and, uh, and uh, had a good time. So... Thanks so much for taking the time out this evening. I hope you got uh, some new inspiration and ideas for how you can use social media and social networking as part of your Catholic ministry. And God bless you in all that you do on behalf of the church. Thanks so much. Have a great night.